Nice cold start. Hey, welcome to the Floor You podcast. Trying something different today with Zoom? No music for you. <laughs> <laughs> Joined as always by uh, the guru, Sonny Callam. Sonny, how are you doing? Hello, hello. How's everybody doing? doing They're going to hang up already because you just didn't talk for like 10 seconds. Said record. <laughs> And Paul's going, looking in. Yeah, well, I heard music in my head. Yeah, yeah. I got songs in my head. I'm sitting outside on Sonny's porch right now, so we were going to do it in the same spot, but I figured if he could punch me during the middle of the thing, it wouldn't be a good idea. So I didn't want him on my mountain either. <laughs> we are joined today, uh, very, very fortunately, by a good friend of mine, uh, Lisa Lavender, and her head of training. What's your title there, Chuck? Uh, Director of Education. Director of Education, Chuck Butal. Was I right? Good, be, Paul. good job, yeah. good job. <laughs> Nicely done. I wasn't going to try it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's only two syllables. <laughs> <laughs> so... Lisa Lavender, she's the, uh, the owner with her husband, Ted Lavender, of uh, Brooks Fire and Restoration and Restoration Technical Institute. The Technical Institute is, uh, does a ton of training that we're going to talk about. Uh, she is a BS in accounting. Where'd you get your degree? Penn State. You. Anyway. You. Anyway. <laughs> That's right. I'm in Big Ten country, so not that we have any sports anymore. <laughs> anyway. Exactly. Yeah, really. And for, and for those of you who listened uh, a couple of episodes ago, we talked about uh, Restoration Technology Institute. We spoke about uh, Lisa, and now we have her on as a guest. So uh, thank you, Mr. Viola. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Yes, Mark's awesome. I'm oh, glad you can have it. I've heard your name for 15 years, but I've never <laughs> met you. So this is close enough. This is COVID yeah, meet, I guess. It's so awesome. Meet. <laughs> so Chuck, you own the AirQuest systems, huh? You made dehumidifiers, desiccant dehumidifiers, and portable air conditioners? Yeah, basically I started in this industry when I was a mainframe computer engineer, and uh, that industry was starting to take a tank. So I uh, answered an ad and went to work for a company called Cargo Care, who in the U.S. is a manufacturer and licensor at the time of Munter's desiccant rotors. So uh, I worked with them installing and basically selling and leasing and renting systems to every application, including drying out large lost buildings. Um, but anywhere, super tankers, dog food manufacturing, quite a bit of different applications for dry air out there. And um, so literally I moved on into that and started drying buildings as a subcontract business for people and didn't really like anything out there. So I went ahead and designed our own systems designed kind of just for rental businesses. And uh, that got sold up. Uh, Phoenix purchased that back in 2007. So it's, it's been a little while since uh, I've been there. And I started training full time at that point in time, trying to semi retire. And uh, Lisa dipped in about 18 months ago and says, now, 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 I got something <laughs> for you. And uh, so actually, it's about two years now. And we built uh, probably the best hands on training center. And that's what we've all been talking about doing the flooring training in the Northeast and everything else is we've got the huge, huge facility for it. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, everything we built COVID hits and whew, you know, everything spins on a dime. And now we're podcasting and uh, <laughs> broadcasting and netcasting and everything else. Out there. We're really, casting and recording. That's exactly. <laughs> it's really but, uh, <laughs> you know, the opportunity that comes out of it's been fantastic though. I mean, you know, what we're doing now is able to reach out to so many people. I mean, right now we've got somebody from um, literally the Middle East signed in to a carpet cleaning class that's going on right now that Mark Violon's having. So, huh. you know, this is not somebody who's going to be able to jump on a plane and fly to the U.S. and take a carpet cleaning class. But now because of the technology we have, um, it opens it up to people all around the globe um, to, to see the standards and, and, and make sure it's done right. And, and you know, I it's funny. Know. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, Mark, it's funny you bring that up because I was just uh, saying to some of my coworkers here how Mark moved me at the beginning of class um, as we did a special welcome to that student um, who was just beaming at 
opportunity for formal training and has actually been doing this for years, doing their work. And Mark was like, I can't even express how moved I am and overwhelmed at the opportunity to teach these skills to people all over the world. So, yeah, nice. you know, it is, it's just like, and you know, we're also busy just making it all happen behind the scenes. It was just like one of those moments. And I was like, oh yeah, that's, that is so cool. And it just kind of gave me chills. And, um, you know, I actually just write, I write a monthly article for r and Magazine, and I just wrote about the new world of training and a little bit of our journey. And I kind of reflected on the uh, old farmer story of good luck, bad luck, who knows, you know, and it's a whole series of events. And the moral of the story is you don't know the end outcome till you've had gone through all these events. It's not just a single thing that determines your destiny. And, you know, I kind of went, okay, we started out the year sold out classes filled with people, filled, filled with cheers and cheer. And then March, we had to cancel six months worth of classes. And yeah. then, you know, we're presented with all these opportunities and the fulfilling experience of having an even broader reach um, in this new world. So it's been a pretty cool, crazy ride the last six months for sure. Yeah, we learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure your industry is like ours. If COVID wouldn't have come through, we wouldn't even be talking about video chats, video training, webinar training. Everything was so personal. It was person to person. They were yeah. reluctant. They didn't want to do it. So it sounds like your industry was pretty close to, to, to ours on the installation mm -hmm. side that, you know, yeah. if we count any good to come out of this entire process, this may be it because I think Absolutely. it is going to benefit like what you said, having someone across the world being able to take a class. I'd, I'd be beaming if I was Mark too. I'll have to text him later and let him yeah. know. That, that's pretty cool to have that on your resume. Yeah, so. it was pretty cool. And you know, it's funny because everybody's hesitant because one of the things I think we enjoy is working with people and helping them in their careers and development and those relationships. And we still get them. We still have that opportunity. And it's really cool. Like we're still, we're staying in contact. We are talking. We have repeat people coming back and reaching out to us. So, you know, I think the initial reaction is like, this is going to be totally different. We're not going to have those relationships built, but we do. Um, and so, and we're deliberate about that, but it can happen for sure. And it's really cool. Yeah. And the same with me being a small business owner, my only expense was going to visit customers. Yeah. So if I don't have to go visit customers, that helps the bottom line. So the lack of sales with the with less travel, I'm able to survive. But yeah. People understood, you know, they, they didn't expect you to be there every other week or every two weeks. You could just make that phone call. And I hope that part stays in our industry. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> it makes it a little easier for everybody. For sure. But I, like you said earlier, Chuck, <laughs> excuse me. I do miss seeing everybody. I think I think it was you who was saying that, but I do miss seeing everybody in the group. There's there's, a, you know, there's about 25 of us who see each other at you know 10 or 12 events a year. I haven't seen them since March. That's FCICA was the last thing that we all went to, and we all went home and were quarantined when we got home. So. Yeah. Yeah, we've uh, the ISCRC has always been very reluctant. Really, the the business model at the ISCRC was for in person classes. And I, there was a lot of momentum going towards online training and streaming training anyway, but that probably put us ahead about two years, if mm -hmm. I had to guess, to, to yeah. the point that we've gotten there. So it's, it's made changes that aren't going to change back. No. That's for sure. <laughs> it really wasn't. I mean, we basically had the same thing. Our, our, our plan was a two year plan and like Lisa and I have been joking about it, the two-year plan to go online training became the two-month plan. <laughs> and, I believe it. Yeah, it was like April and May, and here we are. Guess what, you know, man? Industry's <laughs> taken out to first class, and it sold out in like 11 hours or something like that. It wow. was crazy. So, Industry, you know, we announced it through ISSA group and, and IICRC and SCRT and all of the usual groups that we, we bounce out the, the emails to, to for them to advertise it. And literally they were limited to 20 a class at the time up until July when it changed. And it, 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 it sold out 
like literally inside of a day. It was like some kind of crazy wow. concert sellout or something. And well, we were just blown away by it. And, you know, first class, we had somebody from Puerto Rico who, once again, you know, I can't take a plane to the United States, so here I am. And uh, it's amazing. The ISCRC didn't have classes for two and a half months pretty much yeah. at all because it wasn't allowed. And we got some numbers, and they're, they're recovering nicely. I mean, it's starting to turn back towards the, the amount of increase because of the streaming and online. I mean, it may not even make much of a difference at the end of the year. So yeah. it's, it's helped. That would have been really hard on the ISCRC to, to lose all of those certifications, all those tests, all those classes. Uh, I, yep. Evolve like usual, everybody's going to look back and say, we should have done that a long time ago, right? <laughs> well, I think everybody was trying to kind of get it going, but honestly, there was no market for it. And you know, truly, even myself, I still like having, if I'm going to have 30 people, and I'd rather have them in the classroom and then do the hands-on with them. Um, and I think that's always going to be the first best ability. And especially when we're talking about doing installation and stuff, you know, the videos are fantastic. It helps out the ones who can't get there. And a lot of the people who are already working with craftsmen, just, but they need the the, the fundamental skills and everything else, they can kind of learn that hands-on on the job with other people. But uh, when it comes down to it, there's always going to be a certain amount of hands-on, I think, by the people who want to be just, you know, like literally you still got people out there learn how to get, have build wooden boats by hand, um, you know, in an 11 week course with a master. So um, it's, you know, it's it, amazing. It's amazing how productive we can be when we get put in that sink or swim situation yeah. yep. because it was, it was do this or do nothing. Oh, yeah. You're out. So yeah. Go, uh, high, we're, AFCT, we're out. We didn't do anything. <laughs> it, 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 it was wild, man. I mean, you know, we scrambled, but as soon as ICRC came in the live stream and it was like, Ooh, okay, this is going to work. And, uh, you know, thank God some of the platforms were out there like zoom and whatnot to keep it going. But yeah, you no, know, you, you're right, Sonny. It's like Gunny Highway always says, adapt and overcome, right? It's either that That's or it. you're going to be overcome, one or the other. <laughs> and uh, so it, it, it really has been. But it, it's, you know, like with Mark, we send out packages um, where they've got sample kits of carpet and different things are stained and everything else. So depending on whether it's the spotting class or the cleaning class, um, in repair and reinstallation, he, he, they have to s glue their own pieces of carpet back together using the seam sealer, not using the seam sealer and seeing the difference. So it, it, as it goes, it can be adapted more and more. But I think just bringing more awareness to that, you just can't paste glue on a piece of concrete and stick something to it and know it's going to be fine. Right. Is, is really more than anything else that this is going to bring to people that there is a not only is there a technique but there's a science and a technique that has to be taken care of in order to put it down right and expect a good result out of it so mm -hmm. I, that's what i'm really kind of hoping that yeah. the internet does for us more than anything else is just raise the yeah I mean, well i mean chuck have talked about this a lot because we're like you know it's it's not going anywhere but so we thought about we'll make some specialized programs for hands on, but it's also kind of brought to the forefront the concept of mentorship. And, you know, I think the next phase is that we more formalize and develop some of those programs like a lot of the trades have. I mean, the reality is you don't become a profession experienced flooring who's installer um, from two days of class. You know, that's the reality. It's field experience. It's being out there. You get the fundamentals of. You can only be an inspector to do that. Oh, okay. Inspector. <laughs> but like I joke, like with Mark, you know, the old end, I haven't seen you install, but like he amazes, I call him, he'll probably be horrified that I'm saying this because I call him a ballerino at Carpet Tools because he puts his, you know, belt on and he just floats. Uh, I'm going to use that. Don't tell him I said that. Oh, is don't everybody going to get this? He didn't listen, so you're good. Okay, don't tell him. So, no, because he's like so graceful and amazing and efficient and fluid in his movement. And I'm like, you don't get like that from one class. You know, bottom line, he got that way from, you know, you know his 40 years, I think, of doing it in the field. And so I think whether it's the restoration, the drying, um, 
the all the trades, you know, we're gonna see a push that we really need to develop not just these formal curriculums and get them that formalized training, but we have to kind of give some guidance on mentorship and programs like that to really kind of bring everything together. And, you know, we, we send um, some of our team members that go through the electrical apprentice program and the, you know, plumbing programs. And that's what they do. You know, they work under their master, they get hours signed off. They have to have dealt with X amount of situations. Um, and that's their journey. It's not just their classroom, but they have extensive classroom training as well. So I think we can all evolve, you know, in little baby steps in our new <laughs> training world to this. So I, think well, Mark, I just want to say anybody who knows Martin Violin knows exactly what you meant. Okay, you thank that. you. Because okay. I can, okay. I can totally picture him doing that and I, everything being right where it needs to be. And I, I, I feel like I go to a Broadway show and I watch him. I, I just can't. He mesmerizes me. And I've ooh, seen ooh, him for 12. Ooh, you know, just telling ooh, the I class. Can, that I, he's, so much. <laughs> I actually, I just go like this because I'm like, he's so graceful <laughs> with carpet tools. I don't know how to explain it. Just pirouetting between each move. Yes. Oh my gosh, he's gonna kill me, you know. Okay. I'm gonna mail him a tutu. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he's gonna so kill me. Oh, he'll, he'll laugh because yeah. I've been saying that for years. Would that be the first NAFCT tutu? <laughs> yeah, I'll get the logo right on the side. <laughs> <laughs> well, Maybe, maybe, maybe we can turn it into a ward, though. You know, like once a year. No, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mark man. Yolen Ward is just a just a bell <laughs> reading. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is totally spiraled well, Lisa, out of Lisa, control. Lisa, Lisa, let's <laughs> give it to Mikhail Barishnikov for somebody like that. Lisa, <laughs> I mean it with that most respect and no, awe truly, of his he, skills. He actually is. He, he's he's yeah. like one motion. He's just fluid as everything is laid out and he just moves yeah. through it. And uh, Such a knowledgeable yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. We, he, joke, man. We, we all have the utmost respect for Mark. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and and we do love him. That's why we pick on him. Otherwise, <laughs> it would be a whole nother picking on actually. But okay, for yeah, all yeah. everybody that's watching, everybody that watches this, just don't bring it up to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, there we go. Keep it acquired. Yeah. He also inspired me to go home and vacuum today. So uh, there we go. <laughs> now that I believe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> No, and, and so that's the reason about it is we have the ability to take people with the masterful mind of somebody like Mark and introduce them to people that would just absolutely have zero opportunity to 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 be able to, you know, get a hold of that knowledge and, and take it in and to make it their own. And you know, it's just going to be a good, the, the boom for. I just see people everywhere being able to move their businesses forward, their livelihoods inside of other people's businesses forward, and everything else because of it. And, uh, you know, and then less errors and aggravations out there. Because, I mean, we all think about, you know, a lot of times, you know, well, somebody's carpet in somebody's house, or somebody's floor in somebody's house. But when this thing goes commercial and people make mistakes, these flooring lawsuits get into the millions of dollars. Oh, sure. And, you know. And, and, well, you know, yeah. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, like, in reinstallation class, I mean, Mark goes over – you know, the process of just a general installation of carpet. And I'm like, you sit there and you're like, how many people don't know that there's any kind of standardized process in order to this? Most people don't. And so when you think about getting this out, it all it does is it raises the bar. It makes us all better professionals. It mm -hmm. helps educate consumers. It's a win-win really, I think, for everybody. Uh, and it's not that people are trying to do it they don't know what it's that old saying. You don't know what you don't know till you know, you know. Right. Tell, tell us a little bit about that class you were just talking about, the reinstallation training. What does that cover? Oh, uh, well, I love it. I actually keep, I joke every year when I promote it, I say, I wish they would rename it because um, it's called repair and reinstallation, but you really understand the basics of just general installation of carpet. You learn how to do repairs, seams. But you gain an eye, like, not that I'm an expert, but, you know, just little things like examining a seam and seeing if seam sealer was used, you know, and that is the 
the things you learn um, and just even as a restorer, I mean, it's the last class people take if they take it. And I'm kind of, then once they take it, they go, you were right. It should have been the first class I took because you learn so much about carpet. Carpet's still out there. It's almost always affected. Um, you develop your eye for pre-existing conditions, which allows you to manage expectations, which I'm big on, you know, and document properly. And, and it helps you manage and train your team, subcontractors and everything by just knowing what you learn from that class. So it's much bigger to me. And even like I tell, like if you clean carpet, you need to be able to walk in and identify if a carpet was not installed properly because you can clean it and I bought it because you didn't even know, you know? And right. so there's so, it's a um, typically, I think it's like 14 hours of class. I almost said two days, but now it's all different days. Um, <laughs> and you just walk away with so much. And for people that have um, good tactile skills already, I'm horrible. I can't cut straight. Although I always joke, I could actually seam a carpet when I left, kind of. Um, it may not have been straight, but I could get it stuck together. Um, <laughs> but I need help cutting straight. But but You're you walk to make out. Things good, not invisible. Right, but if you <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. that that's right. You learn that right. too in class. So um, there's no such thing as an invisible seam. But uh, so you know, I gained useful skills that I I use daily. I really mean that because we're always dealing with flooring things, and so. For us to understand um, a lot of this, I mean, it's in our world every day. And so that particular class um, is just so well done and so valuable. Not only can you gain skills, but just the general knowledge you gain. Yeah. And, and then, I mean, you know, these are some of the things that we want to get out there, like on our free website, as we start building out like, like a consumer website is is literally because i mean i'll put it to you this way it, it's a funny story and i talk about it all the time so we have an office in in south mississippi and we were selling it and the two back rooms of carpet were trash and they're very small offices like eight by ten type rooms so it's like we're walking through a big box store who shall be renamed nameless who gives free installation and you know you get what you pay for and literally the guy comes out because my wife loved the carpet. She locked it, looked as beautiful. I said, well, okay, hold on. I'll see what it's made of. And, you yeah, know, okay, yeah, good manufacturer, good carpet. Actually, it'll work fine. So the guy comes out, long story short, to install it. And I saved putting the baseboard on until after he was finished because that way he didn't have to worry about nicking the baseboard with one of his tools. And he's like, so where's the baseboard in the second room? And I'm like, well, I was going to put it down afterwards. And he looks at me and he says, but the baseboard is what holds the carpet to the floor. And yeah, there you go, Paul. And I'm not making this up. This is <laughs> and I, he goes, you know, the baseboard is what holds the carpet down, actually, I think would be more of a verbatim thing. And I'm looking at him and I says, well, what about the tackless strip? And he's like, well, what about the tack strip? And I'm like, well, you know, the idea is you strip it over the tacks and it faced towards the wall kind oh of thing. Oh, my gosh. And you know, we stretch it in place. It's called the stretching carpet. And he goes, what do you do for a living? <laughs> and then I told him, and he's like, oh, well, you know, I don't have a power stretcher on the truck. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's like he knew a little bit about what he should have been doing, but, you know. You still pay too much for labor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and free install. And, uh, you know, and then the funniest That's part it. was, you know, it's like we had to have him come back out and roll it back up because he actually didn't tape the seam on the pad. So when he dragged the carpet over it, he actually rolled the pad in one one spot. We didn't catch that. So, you know, it it is there, man. And uh, so, you know, we laugh about it, but a homeowner wouldn't know that. You know, somebody like me, I, I'm like, okay, man. Okay, you know, the free install, not only clicks, I can't complain too much because of the price, but damn. And, uh, you know, it, it was funny. But I use this story all the time because it, it literally happened. And I mean, you know, it's like, come on, man. You know, the, the, the baseboard tucks the edge underneath it so you can't see the edge of the carpet. Maybe it hides the edge of the carpet, what's holding it down. But uh, that was an interesting well, comment. You know, we've gone through and we said a lot of our, our listeners, viewers, depending on how they're getting the podcast, are in the installation community. I'm sure they enjoy that story just because they deal with that every day. <laughs> yeah. Hacks yeah. doing it wrong and them trying to charge a fair price to do it right. 
But in the restoration industry, you hire installers direct, you work with subcontractors, you replace a whole lot of flooring. What do you do to find installers? How do you find installers? Where do you go for them? Um, do they have to do a lot with the subfloor or what's your process there and what's your expectations mm -hmm. of installers? Yeah, well, we typically look high and low because we always need a team of, you know, from wood, vinyl, tile, carpet. And so um, tip, a lot of times we'll take care of the subfloor and or can save it. It just depends on the project, our manpower in-house. Um, so honestly, any installers that want to work with restorers just start banging on the doors because they will... Uh, have a conversation with you and I think would roll a red carpet out because that's how we would do it here. If uh, somebody approached us and said, I'd like to get on your uh, flooring installer subcontractor list, we would <laughs> roll out the red carpet for them for sure. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, really, I mean, we are touching floors every day. When I say touching, there's nothing we do that a floor is not affected. Um, you know, and I know uh, from my flooring friends, you guys are very passionate because you're like, the world is built on floors. We live on floors, but you're right. And, you know, so really anything that affects a structure, a building, a property, commercial, residential, whatever, a floor is involved. And so um, whether we're drying them, saving them, repairing, replacing, we are dealing with them literally every day. And so the more expertise, the more help we can get, the better. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, when I first started Cargo Care, and then which turned into Munther's Moisture Control in New Orleans, I went through four flooring companies, um, finding somebody who would. Yeah, uh, that's where I started out at. And uh, so, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say that's trial by fire right there. Oh yeah. Well, hey man. Well, I grew up in the city. As a matter of fact, oddly enough, my family's been renting commercial property since the 1850s. So, I actually knew people to call, and they were like, "Man, well, you're a restoration company. You going in? You dry out that floor and save that floor? And man, you you know you're a competitor of mine." And I'm like, "No, no, no. Actually, probably 70, 80 percent of the floors we replace." Um, of the hardwood variety and you know when you're talking about carpet it's probably up in the 80 90 percent range and there's no such thing as like drying a vinyl floor it either didn't get wet underneath or you're going to tear it up to dry whatever is underneath so they're they're either always gone or always saved and even <laughs> when they're damaged the wood floors even if we dry them typically need a sand and refinish so one of the great flooring companies down in the walls mm -hmm. back in the late 80s early 90s when i started the biz was White's Flooring, and White's used to do all my hardwood flooring. As a matter of fact, he, he used to invite me out to his fishing camp um, because I was one of his best customers throwing him more business than anything else. Plus, we got along well. But, you know, it was kind of weird. But the, the restorers need the expertise of the knowledge of the type of floor, the cost of the floor, the construction of the floor, um, and those type of things, and especially the cost and value replacement options, repair options, because the problem is, is that you're good at putting everything back together, but you don't know everything about everything as a restorer, even though I'm sure there's a few out there who believe so. Um, but you, you need that expertise, that technical expertise, and, and especially when you get into the exotic, expensive hardwood floors and those type of things, because if you don't, you make a mistake. And I've seen, you know, like I've seen literally people tear out a gymnasium floor and throw it in a dumpster. And it's like, do you realize what we could have done with that maple? It could have been reclaimed, you know, you threw it in the garbage can, man. And um, so that, that's the kind of thing, you know, it's $30,000 worth of wood maybe thrown in the garbage can. And uh, it's like, wow. So they, they don't understand. And the, 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 they, they, like Lisa said, it all starts with the floor. I mean, this is the first thing that literally gets wet. Everybody overlooks it, um, and it drives me nuts that subfloors and stuff is not part of the water damage curriculum because it's like, how can you dry it if you don't even know how it all goes together? And no, uh, You don't know what it should have been to begin with. How do you yeah. dry it? So, yeah. so literally, you know, now the only thing with restorers is, is that, you know, sometimes – People are getting used to getting paid, you know, like 15 days or 20 days or whatever else. And unfortunately, a lot of restorers work for insurance companies. And, well, insurance companies aren't quite so observant on their payout. So 
the one thing I will always tell anybody who's doing flooring in the restoration industry is work out the payment schedules and make sure you got that handled up front because it's going to vary a little bit on depending on who's paying the check initially, I guess, if you will, out there. Right. But uh, no, nah, man, it, it, you know, no matter how good you are, you need that expertise out there. And, um, and now a hard surface is just getting crazy. Um, I, I, you know, so it's so you interesting. When and, they have, when you have an installer come in, have you generally done all of the subfloor repairs? So the only amount of prep they have to do is whatever the flattening and leveling, or do they actually yeah. come in and help restore the subfloor for you? We will often take care of the subfloor. Again, it depends how big it is. I mean, you know, if it's, when things get more um, involved and, you know, just longer time period, just because of the nature of our business, we try not to hold up a crew for like a week project or something. So it really just depends on our in-house schedule. We have, again, our particular company, every restoration company is different. Some will have all trades in-house, some won't, some um, will just subcontract repairs, some stay away from repairs. So every restoration company is a little different. There's not a right or wrong. We specifically have pretty much every trade in-house. So it's more about managing our resources and working with the sub. So the sub may say, I can take care of the whole thing or, but I, or hey, I can get there Monday. You can go ahead and take care of the subfloor. You know, so it's constant communication and working as a team. And that's really what the types yeah. of relationships we want. <clears throat> there are a couple, um, you know, Chuck mentioned, you know, at the onset, there's a couple things that are different in the world of restoration. So one thing is a big thing, if anybody's ever heard of the term ITEL. So we are almost required by almost everybody we work with. It's almost part of the way we move. An initial water loss um, is that we're, we take a flooring sample and send it to ITEL, which is a third-party testing laboratory. And so they'll do an analysis of the product and they'll actually give us the price and that's what goes in the estimate of the subfloor and if there if there's pad if the, you know if there's subfloor um and whatever else from wood vinyl carpet we're required to send an i what we call did you send the i tell in <laughs> you know so yeah, that's the business to have I'm yeah so every piece of flooring just doing the report that's in and, an insured loss i mean to tell you that's uh that's the biz <laughs> well now they have some of our um people we work with actually require us to use it there's an app and yeah, yeah so everybody's messing around with the kit we have like a kit to run the flooring sample through and you get like three average prices so it's pretty um now if you have an odd situation where you know, you literally can't find that material at that price. You know, you can communicate. But again, we have to communicate because when it's an insurance-related loss, we're returning it to pre-loss condition, period. Mm -hmm. So everyone's got to stay on the same page with that. So if there's pre-existing conditions, homeowners want upgrades, business that wants an upgrade, you know, we all have to stay as a team on the same page and make sure we know who's paying for what, really, you know. Hey, Chuck, you got to talk to us a little bit uh, about that background there. Your, your background oh. behind you. Yeah. You have to describe it because some people are just listening. That's the truth. Yeah. Well, so if, you, if you're standing there and you're not quite sure exactly what it is around me, it's some kind of stage or something no one can quite realize. And the reason why it looks so futuristic is it's actually three feet of river water um, reflecting the ceiling back and in, in the, in the top of the walls back across the surface behind me. So I'll slide to the right. You can even see the, the, the chalkboard being re reading there and the pews as they just disappear down into the water. But it's actually flooding um, in the uh, Grand Old Opry movie in, in the theater area. Not movie theater, obviously. In the theater. It, it took me a couple of minutes to figure out what it is, but you can I'll see where the water is above those pews, and yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, and uh, it, it, the, the floodwaters came in, and literally a uh, few of the pictures were sent out to me saying, okay, listen, you know, I, I need, when we're talking about, you know, what kind of flooring is underneath here, I'll be, I was actually consulted on the pews, and uh, we, we were just talking about the wood. Um, and then, of course, they had instrumentation people in because all of the magnificent instruments and so much that was stored at the facility, a lot, tremendous amount of history. So there was a lot of restoration 
people involved in it. Um, actually, thankfully, the flooring was fairly simple. Uh, it was a very expensive carpet, but at this point in time, not definitely not worth saving. So I scraped it up off yeah. of the concrete, and the carpet went back out, and then the pews came out. And were dried and then refinished, and then uh, the beautiful carpet was reapplied back down again. So, did they, did they have to oven dry them, or did they just have did they have enough time to just let them dry? The the pews basically. The good news is the water kind of went up and down fast enough to where they were still dryable, if you will. So um, that was actually the last chance. Is there were two discussions on to whether the pews were going to be removed and put into an exterior chamber, um, which was my recommendation simply because of the fact that that way they could go ahead and start removing the carpet and start drying the concrete down and some other people were just gonna cut the carpet away and dry the pews in place. So you know, you always have these different kind of bids and concepts that come in because there's multiple ways of doing it. And um, <clears throat> it's kind of like, which one's gonna be the best and most efficient for that particular project. So, they they basically got dried and refinished off site, but they they didn't get wet long enough, thankfully, to have to get into a slow bake oven dry process. Because that's that's the thing is, you know, when you got to kiln dry something because it's literally going back to driftwood, um, wet the amount of wetness, then then it becomes a real intense project. And unfortunately, people make mistakes and take something that wet and try and dry it fast and wind up cracking and destroying it because the center has not gotten time to release its moisture through the wood. So yeah, just for my own, how, how old were those pews? You know, that is a question that I do not know the answer to. Um, the Opry land, I mean, it, it, let's see, the Opry itself is from the 30s or 40s. I would expect these were original. Um, Something is not going to be replaced. No. Can't be no. replaced. Now, yeah. and, you know, there, there was amazing because they had a few restoration companies that came in in the musical instrument world. Um, you know, the Smithsonian helped step in. Uh, it, it, it truly was a fantastic project. And, and the people there, I, I like I video consulted on this thing for literally a day or so, um, once or twice while I was somewhere else in the world. It was, like I said, one of the first projects I had done that on another one, I was on my 20th wedding anniversary. And a friend of mine said, how much is going to cost you to get to Houston? I said, I'm on my 20th wedding anniversary. I'll let you talk to Jean, my wife, about the, the, <laughs> what, what the cost will be here. will get me out of Cabo San Lucas. And they're like, nah, we'll send you some photos. We know, we, we know the price tag's not going to work, man. You know, we probably replaced the building for that price. So, uh, But this one here wasn't too, too bad. And uh, so it, it was literally a massive amount, effort. To, to get after it quick and, and you know, because the issues is when you get into the instruments, you've got the sound boards and, you know, you've got the multiple plies and the guitar manufacturing and everything else. It, it is truly amazing um, when it comes into it. But, uh, you know, the, the hotel next door, the Opryland Hotel flooded. There was just millions of square feet of carpet in that hotel um, and, and all down the river. It was really a mess. But um, imagine. Yeah, and uh, well, it, it's not something that won't not repeat. Unfortunately, they're they're on a floodplain there, um, right along the river, the Cumberland there in, in Nashville. So it's uh, it makes one wicked bend just downstream. <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> when it rains a lot, of, <laughs> yeah, I mean they do good. The TVA does a great job with the dams, but sooner or later, you know, they, they all fill up and they got to spill water. So, but. Uh, it's it's nice to know that it's behind it, but that, that's the idea about it is, you know, it's a classic example here is, you know, what do we have down here? Do we have down $30 a square yard? Do we have down $90 a square yard? Is this wool? Um, you know, it's the first thing. We had a rug um, came into the plant and it was sitting there trying to get the red bleed out of some of the white areas. It was a presidential seal rug. And I'm like, man, you know, first I'm looking at it and I'm like, it doesn't, that's a wool rug. And they go, what do you mean? So I pull uh, a couple strands of the fiber and do a burn test. It's like, well, the first thing you got to know is what you're working on. What are you this working is on? Mechanic right. material. This is not plastic. <laughs> That's why it bled so bad because they, they couldn't bleed. They'd never seen one bleed so much. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's because this is organic fiber. So it's uh, ready to rock and roll. It's not, 
plastic that's been pre-filled dye site wise with clear, you know, whatever else. So um, like Lisa was saying, you know, you were asking, it's the carpet, the courses you take that allow you to make those decisions. Well, let's first find out what it is, then we'll determine how we can remedy the issue with it. And that, that's where the crossover is, it's the construction of the materials, whether you're putting them down, whether you're maintaining them, or whether you're debating on whether to replace them or restore them, um, you need to know the construction of the materials. And all three industries basically all have that same fundamentals, you know. And uh, it's just exciting to be a part of, you know. And it's, you know, it's natural disasters happen. So if you're there and you can pick it up and put it back together and make it a little less tough on everybody, it makes it just that much better, you know, so. Were you involved in Katrina cleanup in a year? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was here. <laughs> Katrina, that's, Katrina. That's an understatement, huh, Chuck? Yeah, I've got pictures of that. I, uh, I lost two houses in Katrina. I was selling one, and it just moved into my beach house. So oh, no. it, uh, it leveled my 3,800-square-foot beach house and completely relocated my 1,100-square-foot previous house um, on the bayou, back over a couple more bayous. And uh, the office survived, but our warehouse was laid flat. We took hurricane force winds on the nose for 17 hours and um, right down the road from us um, is the the power company and um, so literally the, the eye wall passed the northern part of the eye wall like degree number five passed over our warehouse and then the bottom of the eye wall passed over the top over our warehouse as well and that's when it, 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 it gave up the ghost. The winds, it handled the winds going one way, but when the wind shifted the other way, it blew it back the other way. And it literally just, it laid the entire warehouse in its entirety back flat on top of itself. So. If you haven't been on the ground watching the eye of a hurricane go over your head, it's, it's eerie. It's a sick feeling because all of a sudden there's just this clear circle going over your head. And I, I, I've seen that. It's, it's not yeah. good at all. No, and the pressure change that you feel um, is really different, and uh, it's a, it, it's a, it, it is it is uh, it is odd, so to speak. As a matter of fact, I thought I was going to be seeing it as uh, Sally is passing right by <laughs> over here, hitting Mobile. But uh, no, as a matter of fact, we did the Beau Rivage Casino, um, Palos Casino, several other hotels. The Hancock County School System. So my friends in the restore restoration business, uh, we, we put a tremendous amount of equipment out there. My entire rental fleet was rented out for weeks and then purchased and um, I built machines, but we got hit. Our manufacturing company, well, it's really kind of a custom job shop. I don't call it a manufacturing facility, call it what it really is, but it's, it's 10 guys in a welding torch as we used to joke about. But the uh, um, literally, you know, it laid the warehouse. We us two dumbasses on a microphone. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, hey, you know, and uh, the way I look at it is, this is the way the best stuff comes out, man. And uh, mm. so, yeah, that's how it is. Our, our design started off of a, a scratch pad, literally. But we 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 built machines in nine days after we got hit by the hurricane. We were back up in manufacturing because we had a a plan oh. for our business that if we were going to get hit which down here is more like when you're going to get in, right. um, you know, it is literally, uh, you know, the, the, well, so I had literally backup distributors for control panel manufacturing and, and blower shipment and aluminum welding and whatnot. And we just got in components from other places and kept on building. So it was kind of interesting, but uh, hmm. yeah, it, you never imagine. know. But Katrina was a serious butt whipping, man, when it comes yeah. down to it, it was, uh, it was so large we hadn't had a hurricane that powerful that big before you know we we we've had hugo andrew um categories fours and fives but they were relatively physically small in size with uh, katrina the water that's why i got out i told everybody you know look there's there's no stand here the, this thing is not not to be reckoned with mm -hmm. you deal you're dealing with a hundred and fifty hundred and sixty mile tornado a mile an hour tornado basically that's going to hang out here for about 12 hours and uh you know it's just uh nothing nothing was untouched in its path i guess is, is the biggest one i've seen i was literally 140 miles away from the eye and i was still experiencing hur hurricane force winds almost over as far as panama city mm -hmm. florida was where i was heading to and, wow 
How long did how long did you have to wait before you get back to your your shop? Well, it was gone. Um, so basically, it, the, the Sunday we bugged out, and um, once there was. Sunday morning, it was 120 mile an hour storm early, early, like 4 a.m. And it was kind of like, hey, you know, we can we can board up and hang on to this um, at noon on Sunday or well, just before noon, 11 o'clock, 1030, somewhere in there. They came out 10 o'clock advisory. It's 180 mile an hour cat five. We just laid the plywood down and told everybody time to go. Uh, you know, Goodbye. right now, the best thing to do is let the water blow through the doors and windows and hope the structure stands. But reinforcing the coverings, that just makes a larger wall um, surface impact wise. And, uh, you know, but the house was laid flat anyway. It didn't make much difference. So we all got out and uh, Monday we rode it out. So Tuesday we chainsawed our way back down the highway um, with the RV. And I got to the office on Tuesday, which was 13 miles inland. And um, um, we couldn't get down at all on Monday evening down to the, to the bay in the coastal areas. But uh, once we got down where we could cross over on Tuesday morning, um, we were able to get down there with uh, our large dualies and high water vehicles and things like that because it left behind about two foot of mud in a lot of areas. So the eight, 10 feet, 12 feet, 20 feet of water left, but literally there was a coating of six minutes, six inches to two feet of mud covering everything like snow. So the worst part is you didn't know where the road was, where the ditch was. You didn't know if there was something in the road. So the swamp, there's one or two swamps down there. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I had never actually expect, seen that before because uh, it, it didn't happen in Andrew. Uh, it, it basically cleaned everything down to the, the, to the sand. And the same thing with Hugo and Carolinas. Uh, it, it, it hit and it didn't leave behind a lot of mud like that. This storm, it was really treacherous driving because you didn't know what the heck was underneath the mud, you know, and uh, it was a little, it was a little freaky, but, uh, you know. Well, like, everything there is a bridge to get in there. So trying oh, to navigate the bridges, I can't imagine now. Yeah. Yeah. When it, when you, when you see literally, you know, six lanes of concrete bridge just lifted up and thrown into the water by the wave action, because this is what happens is the bridges, the pilings here and the, the cap is sitting on it is just on there by weight. So every right. time the wave hits it, it just kind of moves it a little bit each time. And then all of a sudden, the whole bridge just falls in the water. And now you got pilings going from one side of the bay to the other. So, yeah, uh, it was it was they fished, them out and put them, they fished them out and put them back on then or make new ones? Actually, oddly enough, uh, most of the time they're, they're breaking into pieces and stressing past their limits when they fall in. But um, I heard that they did that on the I-10 going back into New Orleans when they put half of it back together. They literally had twin bridges. They took what was missing on one and put it onto the other one. And then I heard that they resurrected a few pieces off of the lake bottom to put up top. And then the Corps of Engineers and the U.S. military came in and they have the metal bridging capability where they can literally um, expand out almost like a fold out bridge, if you can imagine such a thing. Mm -hmm. And they literally just assembled it on top of the pilings and patched uh, a good half mile or so of the 12 mile bridge um, with, with metal framing. So really kind of wild. It's amazing how things go. Um, with, uh, with, that's with, scary. I, we love New Orleans. We go there. We usually go once a year. We didn't go this year, obviously, for COVID. But um, yeah, so we, we learned a lot and read a lot about Katrina. And it just interests me to always hear those stories. I didn't mean to take the whole thing on the sidetrack. But no, to no, me, no. I, I think it's, you know, as long as, it, as, long as everything's okay, you know, I, I like hearing those stories about Katrina. Yeah, you know, everybody rebuilt. When you guys get down there, we'll have to do a real behind-the-scenes tour, and I can take you up to some real personal places that are real interesting stories behind it. Nice. I'll show you some pictures. There's a few villages that are just now completely gone. Where I grew up at was the little fishing village is now completely, completely gone, man. But, uh, so you never know. But wow. the next time, it always changes. But, uh, you know, the, the city's now stronger than ever. The coast is nicer than ever. So it's like everything else. It, it gets beat up and then you just build it back, you know. But he still, I'll tell you one thing, he saw lots of floor covering in a couple of years. After. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, they did. Yes, they did. I just yeah, remember this pride. You reach well, more in the entire city. That does take up a lot of material. Yeah. Well, now you got Lake Charles to take care of, and it looks like Mobile may be next because uh, the way this thing's moving really slow like this, there's going to be a lot of flooding in, in, in um, Mobile without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah, everybody in Mobile, our thoughts and prayers are with you, especially yeah. Pat Hilliard. He's a good friend of mine, Hilliard and son. Yeah. So we'll, uh, I'm going to hang up, and when we hang up, I'll check on him. So I didn't realize it was going there. It's going to be a rainer mostly. The, the good news is the winds are down to 80 miles an hour. By the time it gets to Mobile, the winds will probably be 60. So there'll be a few trees falling over, but it's mostly flood rain water because it's moving so slow. This is going to take literally 36 hours from when it starts hitting the shoreline, which it just did this morning, until sometime tomorrow afternoon when it's completely clean of it. So it's, a, it's an incredibly oh, wow. slow moving storm. And uh, it's going to hit us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's going to probably make that bend. Might catch you guys right up there in the top of the bounds. But I, I tell you, it's it's a great place. Uh, I went up the mountains in Greenville, and I was uh, well north of you guys, and uh, and I was up there. And this is before the days of GPS, everybody. Okay, it really was like four wheeling before we had a thing that told us exactly where we at, and. Uh, I run into a guy up on the top of the ridge as I come back halfway down, and the guy's like, hey, well, where are you at? I says, well, I says, I'm good as long as you can tell me whether I'm in North Carolina or in South Carolina, because if I'm in North Carolina, I'm on this road. If I'm in South Carolina, I'm on this road, and then I know which way I got to go. So all I need to know is what state I'm in, actually. State. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, follow me on down. So he took me right on down, man. I think that's great. I love the, the mountain country up that way. It's fantastic. That's nice, beautiful. We love it. We absolutely love it. Got it. Cool, man. So, yeah, I mean, there's no end to, to, to truly before we got off on that, that path. There is no end um, to restorers and, and floor covering installers. And truly, sometimes, like Lisa said, full um, due to construction, reconstruction, as well as putting in the floor, and sometimes we'll take care of it at a time. Most of the time, it's literally just a reinstall over, um, you know, and a replacement of what was there before. So a lot of times it's not too difficult at all. But, uh, you know, and then customers, sometimes they like to upgrade, change things. Yeah, I, I think we got off topic a little bit <laughs> today due to me. <laughs> but I, I think we could have a whole other episode. One thing that we like to focus on here on the Pull You podcast is career path. How, how do we get to where you are and how does someone get into restoration? And I think we could, we, we could do, maybe we'll get you guys together again soon and let's talk about what needs to be done because there's certain certifications that you need to have, obviously. But uh, there's a lot of guys who are looking and gals who don't want to continue installing until their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Mm -hmm. So they're looking for options, inspections, sales, technical restoration things like that i think it would be a good topic to cover i've got a i've got in my chicken scratchings here just to give everybody an idea of of what kind of classes they put on Let's see if i can read this my my, my <laughs> hand right applied microbial remediation applied structural drying basic construction for restoration professional biohazard training infectious disease and biohazard decontamination carpet cleaning tech carpet repair and reinstallation insurance for the restorer, color repair, commercial drying, media blasting, upholstery and fabric cleaning, fire and smoke restoration, fire and smoke odor control, moisture mapping and monitoring, water, <laughs> re water restoration tech. These are all classes that are offered throughout the year at Restoration Technical Institute. They're and we take requests, Paul. We take that. special requests too. We always say, tell us what you want, because that's how we come up with new curriculums. Okay. That's how we learn. As a matter of fact, I can tell you, Sonny, one of the best success stories is right there is Lisa. She definitely had a path to restoration that's exceptional and different than a lot of people's as well. We'll have to showcase her one time there. <laughs> that, because I'll awesome. tell you, the, the, the company Berg's Fire and Water, what they do in, in the size, physical size area, the, the, the personnel, people size area, the population that they have is, is truly amazing. It's, it's like uh, competitors come and go all day um, in, in there because it's like 
they have mastered the art of building the team, doing it right, and standing on your reputation so that you can stand there for a really long period of time. And um, you, know, you can't do that without the right team members. And that's the whole idea. That's why Lisa really got into the, to the training side of things was literally to, like you guys were saying, build it all better. Because we build it all better, we build up the whole, mm-hmm. the whole, the whole group. Everybody does better. Everybody, you know, and you start getting recognized for what, you're, what it actually takes to do it right. And um, that's one of the things that we really like to hear about. But uh, nice. lots so of classes. Do they, how do they get a hold of you, Lisa? How do our, uh, our viewers reach you? Where do they go to reach out for classes? And um, how do they get scheduled for them if they want to go attend? Awesome. So they can go right to our website, restorationtechnicalinstitute.com. We are working on a shorter one. <laughs> um, and I don't know what we were thinking eight years ago. Um, and they can also email me at Lisa at restorationtechnicalinstitute.com and Chuck at restorationtechnicalinstitute.com and our phone number's there. So we encourage people, you know, um, whether students or just industry affiliates, we're here for everybody as a resource, whether it's not just classes for just tips or pointing me in the right direction, connecting me, um, we're here for everyone. So everyone's welcome to always reach out to us. Well, we yeah. want to thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank the uh, thank the ballerina for- I will. I hope I don't get in trouble. Well, and thank you guys oh, so much trouble. for having us. I know. I'm, I'm scared. <laughs> that point's passed already. I, I'm really scared. I'm trying to figure out how we're going to talk Mark into doing anything I else know. for I'm us I'm like, should anymore. I call him immediately after I get off this call? I don't know. He's done with class at five, so we have eight minutes. <laughs> but, um, so, no, don't we worry, really appreciate bring it. Up. Nobody's yeah. going to bring it up. No. Okay. Everybody. Yeah, Everybody. right. It's a podcast. Doesn't that go up? No. So we really appreciate you having us. And we would love to kind of get you guys out in front of um, the restoration pros, you know, in the near future, because I think, you know, this is something we've all talked about for years um, is the overlap and just the, you know, the lack of like, let's learn each other stuff because it helps each other so much. And so we would love to keep the conversation going for sure. I think we can do a live podcast from one of your faci- from your facility. That'd so. be awesome. That'd be cool. That'd be fun. Yeah, that would be. I'm free that week. I keep oh, telling to, Paul to, to get his butt down. Yeah, we <laughs> could do that. We could actually do one from the flood house or something like that. And uh, that'd be pretty sharp because it's, it's now not just the flood house. Now it's the demo house. Well, actually, it's the demo building, I guess, technically, because we've got uh, – We've got most every type of flooring down there, so we could definitely do yeah. something like that out of it. Nice. That, that would be fun. I'd like to do that. Sounds yeah, good. Absolutely. Well, this is usually where I start the outro music. Does somebody want to hum something? So we let me know. Chuckle dun, sing. Dun, chuckle dun, sing. Dun, 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 <laughs> there you go. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for being on. No, I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, guys. Right, thank you. Take you guys. care. Thanks, Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>